So in the last lecture on hexaspace signatures, I end by showing um, stateless hexaspace, stateful hexaspace signatures, explain that it's sometimes a problem, but also explain that there are some use cases where one might be happy to use those. And so the main ingredients for stateful hexaspace signatures are these Merkle trees, and well, in XMSS or in LMS, there are trees of those Merkle trees. And I briefly explained how you do this, but I didn't have the drawings, so let's briefly run through the drawings. So this is just a simple tree. This is how you combine eight signatures using just one public key up here. And I want to simplify my drawings because, well, if I have to have trees of trees, the slides are going to get rather full. So I will now change the bottom layers here to just using one-time signatures and I just indicate them by TI. So those are going to be both covering the secret key and the public key. So that's where those are living. And then in the place of the hashes, I'll just put dots. So here you see the same picture. The root of the tree is the public key. Um, incoming arrows going upwards, those are inputs to hash functions. So when you see, for instance, this node above T5 and T6 here, then that is taking the public parts of T5 and T6 and hashing them together to form that node. And so now when you build a tree of a tree, then the idea is that you can use the bottom layer, those eight one-time signatures, not to directly sign messages, but to sign public keys of the next level. So we're using this first tree as a tree that publishes or that provides our public key that everybody knows from us. But then those T1 till A, T8 are used to sign one level lower public keys that only stick around for the eight messages that they're used for. So here the one time signature T5 is used to sign the public key of this second level tree. And then down here we have one time signatures again. And those are then used for the message. Or of course, if you have more space on your slides, then you can also have multiple levels of trees. Another benefit is that in order to publish your public key, you only need to build the top tree. The downside is that, well, when you move from one of those to the next, it feels like you're building a whole lot under it. And I was referring to Andreas Hülsing's thesis for having an optimal scheduling for those things. Let me here focus though on what the signatures look like. So if you have this message here uh, down there, then it gets signed with the one-time signature that is in this T52. So there you're revealing some part of your secret, you're showing the public part to it, or well, depending on what signature you're using, it might not even be necessary to include the public key because well, to verify the signature, you hash it, and then you hash together, you hash together, etc. So then each Merkle tree always has an authentication path. So for the bottom tree, this would be the one-time signature, and then authentication path would need to include this node, the public part, this node, and this node. And then you can compute this public key and compare it with it. But in this case, you don't know this public key beforehand, but the signature, this long thing now, would include a one-time signature using this key on PK5. And then the authentication path that links the secret and public part of T5. Well, you need the matching siblings to the public key that you know. And so for those eight signatures, PK5 is used. And yes, each time you're getting a signature under T5, but it's the same message. So T5 is only used on one message, so that's not a problem. And you don't need to know this public key, PK5, when you're generating the top tree. You can have this with multiple trees. You can have this asymmetrically. If, for instance, T1 is on a day where you don't have much time, you can make a small tree under there. If T5 is on a day that you have lots of time, or, oh my god, you're running out of signatures, you can make a bigger tree under it. The bigger the tree is under it, the longer the authentication path. And if you have multiple levels of your trees, then for each level, you need to include also a signature. So for each tree part, you're having the siblings in the authentication path. 
So if there are three levels, you have three siblings. And then you have per these three, you have one one-time signature. So here it's two one-time signatures and three of the siblings. Another old idea to get towards stateless signatures is goes back to Goldreich, who also created Levin with it. Um, you can think of these trees now being shrunk to just the one-time signatures. So no hashing at all, just one-time signatures next to each other, but lots of them. So here's a picture, again using the double downwards arrows to indicate signing. There's no single upward level indicating hashing. And this is a truly huge tree. So at the bottom here, you're having 200, 2 to the 100, 256 different signatures. That is large enough so that if you try randomly picking them, you'll never hit twice the same. So that's where the collision probability comes in, in the square root. And so 2 to the 256 is large enough that this won't happen. So each message can randomly pick which one-time signature at this bottom level it wants to have used. Well, okay, so this M here determines it wants to be signed by TR. And now the path up to the public key on the top, so the public key of the signer would be the public part of the one-time signature T1. And then we need to include a complete path to go up. What does it mean now to have these signatures there? So T1 signs the public parts T2 and T3. And then similarly, if you have T2, that is used to sign T4 and T5. T3 signs T6 and T7, etc. So any TI signs the tuple, well, it's just a message. TI signs T2I and T2I plus 1. So this is exactly like what, this, uh, what the children under one of the parents are. Now, you cannot pre-compute this. You cannot do the same ideas in Merkle. Nobody can compute 2 to the 256. So it's important that you have some function that tells you, oh, this is where you are in this position. So you want to have that the secret in a certain position is a function of some master secret. And so the key that belongs to the one-time signature ti um, is generated as taking i as input to hash function where there is an index k. So the k here is your master secret key. And okay, now we can think of how to sign this m. So then you generate the secret key hk of r, because that's what the signature belongs to. Then that is the secret key for the one-time signature. The public key for it, well, that's what happens when you hash it, and you also need to generate its neighbor. So let's assume that r is even, then the neighbor is tr plus 1, and you have to generate their parent. Well, to generate the tr plus 1, you first generate the secret, so you're getting hk of r plus 1. When you have the secret, you can get the public key, and then you take those two things and hash them, well, you, no, you don't hash them together, you sign them together using one level up, so that is then the tr over 2 signature key, where again you compute the key, you then compute the key of the neighboring one to get those public keys, you sign them as one level up, so at each point you're getting one direct neighbor, so it's similar to the authentication path before, except for this time the hashing is inside the one-time keys, and not also. Now you should be concerned, for instance, looking at this T3 there. This T3 gets used for TR, but it also gets used for T2 to the 256 minus 2. Now each of those bottom layer leaves has a very small chance to be used, but T3 is included in every right half. So T2 is included in every left half, T3 is included in every right half. So as soon as you sign more than two signatures, to sign two more than two messages, you will have used one of those two twice. And it's a one-time signature scheme. However, 
what I was so far explaining as a functionality requirement using the um, deterministic function, this h sub k of i, to get the secret, it seemed like a convenient way, but it's also very, very important for the security, because that means that whatever t3 signs is always exactly the same. So whenever you are in this right side of the tree, where t3 is a signature required, then you will compute up to there, and t3 will be used to sign t6 and t7, never anything else. And, well, that means it's used exactly once. It is signing the same value that doesn't contradict it. It's a one-time signature scheme, so there is no break on that. So this is taking the idea of trees of trees and shrinking each of those trees to just the leaves, leaves being equal to the top. So you're signing the next public key, which is equal to the leaf itself. It works, but it's also really, really big. So there's a lot of optimization doing some, well, Winternet's 16 times signatures at the bottom layer so that the one-time signatures can sign more than one bit. You still want to sign something like 256 bits because of the typical hash length that you're getting. Then using this, you would get uh, 600 kilobytes, so 0 0.6 megabyte for each signature. And if you're thinking of where signatures are used, then the typical thing is, well, you're doing a network connection to your bank or your email provider, webmail provider or something. And then, okay, you want to have a signature that that is the right thing. But those signatures are typically on like certificate chains or something. So you're first signing, or well, you're getting a signature for the bank, but that one is signed by somebody higher up and higher up and higher up. But even a single signature, 600 kilobytes, is larger than a typical um, web page. So for instance, when you're looking at uh, operating system updates, so if you're a Debian user for Linux, then most of your updates are rather small. So you're just getting 1.2 megabytes, for instance, for an update package. And it's even smaller for the media. Now, that means there are lots and lots of small ones. The average is artificially large because sometimes there is a big update. And so if each time you get slapping on 0 0.6 megabyte, that is quite dominating. If you're looking at web pages, then the typical web page is just three times the size that the signature would have. And if you have a signature chain, it would have two or three of those uh, signatures. So, all right, it's stateless, but it doesn't really work. Now, what we did with, with Sphinx, and also now with Sphinx Plus, which is our submission to the NIST competition, is putting those two ideas together. So we have this tree of trees, as in XMSS or XMS multi-trees, where you have one tree signs, the next tree signs, the next tree, and so on. So the same idea that I just showed on the previous slide, on the early slide, with two trees. So the top tree, next tree, and so on. So if you want to get full height 256, say, as in the example for Goldreich, then you're splitting this up into several subtrees. So we're going for each of the subtrees has only height 60. And then we're also going for not one-time signatures, but something which is called few-time signatures. And uh, to see an example of this, you should check out the exercise sheet 4, which by now you should have done already. And that is showing you something which is not a one-time signature, but you can use them a small number of times. Um, you can continue using them afterwards, but there is a decay in security. And so if you're now thinking of this Goldreich example, where you have to make sure that the bottom layer, these 256, is large enough that you don't ever hit the same one twice, if you have few time signatures at the bottom layer, that means you don't have to have so many leaves at this bottom. So that also helps. So the horse, which is the uh, few time signature scheme that we used in the the design of swings then turns into horst because it's used with trees. And then, okay, there's 12 layers above that, so the tree height of 60 gets split over some layers, and then there's a whole bunch of constructions going in of how you construct 
um, the individual secrets and how you use masks and getting the right places and so on. So if you want the full detail of Swings, you can go to swings.cr.myp.to or you can also see um, our NIST submission. So that's the even nicer, even more recent version of what we're recommending to do in full detail, specified everything that is at swings.org.